Welcome to the Nicolera Show. This is the place where we explore big ideas with people having a big impact on our world. I'm your host, Nick Hilera, serial entrepreneur, author, early morning riser, and seeker of truth and wisdom. Join me as we explore the journeys and discoveries of fascinating people who are literally unlocking the secrets to creating a life of both success and fulfillment. Each episode will arm you with insights, ideas, and practical perspectives on what it takes not only to be financially and personally successful, but also how to start having authentic impact on the world around you. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Nicolera Show. This week, our guest is Will House, a civic entrepreneur, the CEO and founder of a really innovative company addressing one of the, the biggest issues in the world today. The company is Over It, and the issue is addiction. Will, thank you so much for being here. Hi, Nick. Yep. Thank you for, for having me. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be part of the show, and uh, yeah, thanks for, for uh, inviting me on here. Yeah, I'm really glad that we, we are making this happen because I, I came across your company in, in one of the mini newsletters that I, that I read and I found it so interesting and I reached out to them and they connected us. And so here we are. And I figured the best place to start this conversation is, is maybe to talk about just addiction in general, because I feel like we are living literally in the midst of like a, a crazy addiction boom in not, not just in America, it's probably global. But let's talk about that first. Like what, what exactly in your view is like the, the size of the problem? How big of an issue is addiction? So it, it's, it's significant, you know, it's the numbers vary, but when you sort of look at both addiction and, and mental health, which we look at, you know, there are various numbers, but we see, you know, around 82 million people that are, you know, over 18 years of age that here in America that are struggling with mental health issues and, and, and addiction related issues. And, you know, that's the latest from SAMHSA. But, you know, the, the statistics that I've seen and heard are one in three households, you know, either know someone who's been affected or they themselves have been affected. And, and, you know, there's no shortage of people now, you know, almost everyone you, you talk to has in some way been impacted. But yeah, the, the, the problem's massive. And the scarier number, Nick, is, is more around the number of people that get into treatment. You know, if you consider that, yeah, you know, about 50% of people are struggling with mental health. In, in the most recent studies. And let's just say 50 million are struggling with just substance use. So that goes away from everything else. But about 90% of them do not get into treatment. And then the ones that do, you know, 80 to 90% or, or more actually relapse and fail. And that's the problem. And, you know, the, the access to resources is is extremely limited as well. And so we've got this sort of like escalating problem and, you know, you see it, it's prolific in, in cities across, across the nation and, and around the world as well. And, and it's devastating and, uh, and it can happen to, to really anyone, you know? So yeah, it's, it's, it's a big thing that we're dealing with and, and we're, you know, wanting to, to make a big impact on it and, and help fix or at least close the gap because it's widening and that's, that's a big concern. Yeah. Sobering. I'm not sure that that's the best word to use, but it's, it's sobering <laughs> to think about it. Yeah. For word. Okay. Uh, just the, the scale of the, of the problem and it's manifesting in, in crazy ways. Like I, I'm pretty sure the numbers of just like overdose deaths, like the charts, a crazy chart. It was like in the in the year two thousand or something. It was like thirty thousand, and the last several years, it's been close to like ninety thousand. It, it's yeah, it went over a hundred, actually a hundred thousand, which is obviously you know historical high, and uh, yeah, it's it's tragic. Yeah, yeah, and even even compared to like other causes of death, like. When you, when you cross a hundred thousand, like you're getting, you're getting into like high up in the ranks of that, which is really sad. Yes. Yeah. And, and, you know, I remember, you know, I, I've, I've been in recovery myself and have had, you know, my own struggles through, you know, lifestyle and, and just things like that. And, and, you know, I, I went to an AA meeting a few years ago and, and 
someone had mentioned about fentanyl and I hadn't heard about it. I guess this was probably 2017 or 2018. And I remember thinking at the time, you know, that's going to be devastating. That's going to cause, that's going to be horrific. If that makes it to the streets, that's going to cause a huge issue. And of course, sure enough, a couple of years later, it, it, it did and has. And, you know, the thing that's scary about opioids is that you see people get injured. They're going about their life. They're maybe they're an athlete, maybe they're just, you know, a normal person that twists their <laughs> back in the garden or, or something of that nature or has an accident that wasn't their fault. And they go into hospital. I had a kind of a, my first experience on opioids actually was, um, you know, going into the hospital and, and not being able to breathe properly in 2014. It turned out to be pneumonia. But the first time I went in there, they basically said to me, we're not sure what it is, but hey, you know, here's a prescription to help you with the pain. And, uh, you know, so, and, and I learned firsthand how, how addictive that, that stuff is and how it makes you feel. And, and it's, it's, it's pretty terrifying. And fortunately for me, I was able to, you know, I didn't, it, it wasn't something that really took hold, but for others, it's devastating. You know, there are people who, have never, would never consider themselves to have an addictive personality or be, you know, that way inclined or, you know, and yeah, they take these things, these that, that are designed to, you know, basically hook people long term and, uh, and it does and it's severe and it's, yeah, it's sad to see what's happening and, and, you know, here, Obviously, I'm in, I'm in the Bay Area and, you know, San Francisco is just obviously not the same. They're you know, obviously working to, to improve things, but yeah, it, it, it's the opioid situation obviously is, is something that we need to really address. And, and, you know, I think the positive side of things is that stigmas are shifting. I think that yes, the problem is, is increasing and yes, people are struggling more and more. I think it's fair to say that, you know, since 2020, we've all had a, a tough time, you know, and, and I think there is work to be done and it's all interrelated, you know, and we, we often talk about decoupling, you know, substance or let's just say an addictive trait from from a behavior and so what i mean is whenever you kind of look at a, a situation that's less than favorable that is happening you know for whatever reason you know generally what 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 the way i look at things is to kind of think well what's going on you know the mentally to drive that behavior that leads to the use of substance or whatever that output is and so it's a different way of looking at it, but we, we take that approach. And so we're, we're trying, as, as I think about the problem, it's important to provide solutions on, on the front end, you know, as it relates to overdose, you know, Narcan is obviously extremely uh, effective, but it's not the solution. Medication is extremely effective and can be helpful in certain situations for certain people. And, and we want to support it with a platform that that can help to to kind of tap in to change the behaviors that lead to that output in the first in the first place. So, yeah, I want to get into over it in a minute, but I want to close the loop on this just broader conversation for a second. One, you mentioned fentanyl and and the story about how people kind of get addicted unwittingly maybe to opioids. And I, I had the exact same fact pattern that you just described happen in my life where a woman that I work with regularly, she came over to do some work and started telling me about her mom passed away. Her mom's in her late sixties and she had gotten into like a fender bender was prescribed opioids and then ended up in the streets of LA, not far from where I live, like less than two miles from where I live buying fentanyl from these drug dealers and then overdosing. And it's tragic. It's like, first of all, why are they giving her opioids? And second of all, why are people on the streets selling an old woman, you know, fentanyl? Like, geez, what a, what a world. Care. Yeah. What I am pleased to see, Nick, is they're taking action now, you know, particularly 
out here in, in San Francisco against, you know, dealers basically, you know, because it, it, it is murder, right? If you're selling that kind of a product and, you know, you're, you're knowingly selling it to anybody that, you know, so I'm pleased to see that that's coming into the, to the system. I think, you know, it, it's, uh, yeah, it's, <laughs> there are some things that, you know, maybe are not agreeable, but I think that is, is good. And yeah, because, Innocent people are, you know, get targeted and, you know, look, I, I think things are shifting and, and they have to, and, you know, but it's, it takes more than, you know, one person or one company or, or even a hundred people to, to, to help shift this thing. And I think there are some exciting things coming down the pipeline and, I've seen some recent things, you know, coming, you know, down from, from the White House administration that, you know, clearly acknowledge that we've got to fix the problem. And, you know, we really have a responsibility. And I, I take it personally as well that through my learned experience, you know, and, and, you know, that we should, be helping people, you know, that are that are sort of experiencing some of the similar things that that I have and that others that, that I work with have to be able to to you know bring them back to where they need to be so they can actually have a better lifestyle. So yeah, I, I want to ask you. I've been thinking about this question a lot because I, I I've I heard it I've heard it many times, sort of in my work, my civic work around town, in response to the homelessness crisis. And it's, it's always bothered me, but I, I, I heard, for example, like well, very well-intentioned individuals thinking, articulating a strategy for dealing with substance, you know, addicted individuals as, Hey, let's just create a safe using environment. And mm -hmm. I understand why you would want to, why maybe you would want to do that because one, you get people off the streets and two, you could prevent their death. But something about that strategy always bothered me because it's like, it's a, it's a hopeless strategy. It's like, okay, so what? We're just going to allow people to remain addicted for the remainder of their lives and, and enable them. Like, what do you think about that? What a great question. I'm, I'm pleased you brought that up. <laughs> I've thought about that a lot and I know that in Vermont, that was sort of one of the pioneering places for, for that, mostly for heroin. You know, Nick, the thing is, and, and I, I don't have experience with that. So that I, I don't have personal experience with that particular thing, but I've seen it and, and I, I kind of understand it. And I've spoken with people that obviously have had experience, you know, with that. And, and obviously opioids is sort of in, in a similar category, I suppose. My, my feeling is it, if it's, if it helps someone to not pass on disease, because that's also a, prob a problem with using dirty needles and things like that. So that's one side of it. The second side of it is if it can help someone to sort of be more responsible, then maybe that's a good thing. But to your point, does it help them actually get off of the substance? I don't think that appears to be the goal, although I'm not an expert in it. I would imagine that there might be a way, though, that if they're accepting care in a way that's basically sort of almost monitored, right? They get taught how to test. They get taught, you know, given clean needles and, and, and you know, equipment basically to to administer, you know, whatever it is that they're doing. I can see the benefit of it. And I, and I think it maybe could be a good gateway to get an individual into a different approach and, and, you know, eventually get them into recovery. I think there are like, maybe there are some people that just are beyond help. You know, I, I don't really like saying that because I do think that everybody has the ability within them. They have the strength and it's just tapping into that and finding that inner person and get beyond the, the doubt and the fear and the uncertainty and the pain and, and whatever else it is that they're, you know, going through and, and the reason why they're using in the first place. But without laboring the point, I think that it could be an effective mechanism 
because if you think about it from a from a mindset perspective, which is where I always like to go, that person has to make a mental a choice, a decision that they are going to go into this facility and they're accepting a level of help and care. And so to me, I I look at that positively as a small step in the right direction. But yeah, what do you think? <laughs> that's, yeah, that, that's interesting. So it's like the the entryway to a greater intervention because you're, you're getting be. there's yeah. a choice behind it rather than like let's say you just like grab somebody off the street and put them in a um, a facility where they couldn't use at all like that that's a forced I'm sure there the the statistics on that being an effective inter- intervention are probably pretty bad I'm guessing because there's no choice involved in it yeah yeah I mean I think that's more it really you know it depends on on the case that's you know inpatient is usually you know a detox you know s- someone that's highly intoxicated needs to go and and completely detox their system and it's actually quite a dangerous you know period in fact and uh you know i think that actually does kill quite a lot of people in 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 recovery i mean you hear it all the time someone here locally i actually did a a 10k run for a person locally that you know, younger person that died in, in withdrawal. And, you know, so it, it, it happens a lot. It's pretty dangerous, you know, when you're going into detox and that's why they do have, you know, inpatient care because you can't just, it, if you're a heavy, you know, opioid user or even alcohol and coming off of that, you know, quickly and suddenly and, and going to nothing can be, can be very dangerous. So it, it does need that level of, of care and things, but yeah. Yeah, I think uh, to to answer the question, though, about what I think about it is uh, I feel like owe more to our fellow citizens. And so if if the strategy was, hey, we are going to a lot create these facilities to make, create safe spaces in order to help get people to stop using then I'm, I'm interested. But if it's just to just like have a safe place to use drugs and I feel like we're just letting people down, like to me, the analogy that I think about is like the emergency room. Like if somebody shows up in your emergency room and you're a doctor and they're dying, like you have to, you're required to work to do what you have to do to save their life. And I feel like we need to apply that same standard, whether we want to judge people for being addicted or not. They owe, we owe it to them. They're a fellow human being. And so that, that's kind of my standard is like, let's do whatever it takes. I know it's going to cost a lot of money, guys, but guess, so what? These are human beings that are dying right in front of your eyes on the street and your children are seeing it. And so that, that's my take on it. I agree. And I also agree about, you know, for, for, for our veterans and, 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 you know, just a level of support for them. And it's just, it's so important and, and they struggle and they have a hard time. And, and, you know, they, unfortunately, many of them are on the street and it's, you know, they need supporting. And anyway, yeah, I, I completely agree with you. <laughs> it's a big top. It's a huge topic. And I would agree that it's just whatever it takes. And we like from my side, I, I like to be open about this, you know, from, from, sort of a personal and, and, and a product perspective, a company perspective that we want to be as open and available and integrative as, as, as we can be to be helpful to anybody. And someone said to me a long time ago, a, an investor who's been around for a long time, you know, he said, look, if, if, if you help even one person and change their life, then that's amazing, you know. And obviously we want to multiply (laughs) that, but it's a good way of looking at things. You know, if everybody had that mindset, then of course we could have a massive impact. If everybody has that approach and everybody thinks about that outside of themselves, just one person, then that means we, you know, basically we all help each other in one way or another and, and it multiplies and that's really what it takes. And it sounds simple, but it's hard to, to even do that. Frankly, you know, everybody's so, everybody's busy, you know, and, and on the one hand, the thing that, that makes, you know, that, that drives the U S economy and, and the reason why this 
country has has gone on to achieve so much in in you know relatively short amount of time is because of the work ethic and because you know of the drive and that's what what I personally love and one of the reasons why you know I I was you know so keen to to come here in the first place and and immigrate here because you know that's very appealing and so you've got that on the one side and then you've got the other side that also creates additional pressure on on ourselves and i think we do put a tremendous amount of stress and you know into kind of how we approach life and and that's why we you know try to be a helpful resource as well and and i've had to learn you know ways and i am certainly no expert but you know, ways in which you know you can cope with these things and i know know you do too nick you know and and how you have to implement and make time for these things that can help you you know mentally physically spiritually and and keep yourself in a in a situation where you know you're able to be effective and and productive but also you know keep your health on on track as well hey guys this is nick i wanted to take a quick break from the episode to share some exciting news In addition to the podcast, I want to make you aware of some additional content we're putting out. And best of all, it's 100% free. Our Profit Plus newsletter consists of weekly insights about what it takes to find meaning in the pursuit of modern success. This is the place where we explore big ideas at the intersection of markets, business, politics, and life as we seek to empower our readers to have an authentic impact on the world. If you're serious about finding fulfillment amid success, then definitely check out these additional insights. Just go to subscribe.nickhilaris.com. Again, that's subscribe.nickhilaris.com. Now let's get back to the episode. The, uh, the advice or the, the message that your, your investor told you, I, I couldn't agree more. I think that's it. It's one of the things that we get, we lose sight of. And you, you look at a complex problem, like even a complex problem that we've been fighting in democracies for like ever, which is poverty. Poverty, if if it was taken down to the individual level, like, hey, how can I help, could actually probably be solved. Like, there's enough wealth in this country where, like, if everybody just kind of took people under their wings that were hurting, you could, like, make a humongous difference on poverty. Yeah. But it would take, like, a revolution. You'd need, like, a, a spiritual figure or something coming on, on Earth to get to get Americans to do that. But it's very <laughs> possible. Yeah. Well, it's it's tough. It's all about choice and making that decision. And we can get into this in the next part, Nick. I didn't want to interrupt the flow here, but you know, let's, let's remember to come back to that, that piece about, you know, something has to happen in someone's mind whereby the conscious choice has, has, has happened where, you know, enough's enough and, and you want to make that change, you, you know, and that's why I sort of mentioned that before when we were talking about, you know, going into a controlled environment, administering, you know, let's say heroin, for example, you know, that, that it's, there's still a decision that has to take place in the mind of the individual. And, and it's that that's the most important part of the process. But anyway, yeah, let's park that for the next piece. I think this this point that you're making about choice is is something that we can't we can't lose sight of because not just on addiction but sort of all the different of life or all the different challenges of life it requires the individual to say yes I'm, I'm in and what's interesting in my view about life is that life will keep challenging you until you say yes essentially and I I, I think. That's what, you know, if, if you study like the depth psychologists and whatnot, that, that's kind of what the, the conclusion they all come to is like, there are certain things that you have to face in your life and you're going to face yeah. them one way or the other. And yes. the key is to make the choice that you're going to do it. And then once you make the choice, then, then interesting things start happening. But taking this principle and company around it, you know, if, inspired by sort of your own experiences with addiction. And that's what originally drew drew me to you. And as I've gotten to know you, I've realized we connect on all these other levels, you know, just sort of the philosophical and spiritual level, but let's talk about over it now. Like what, what is over it? How does it work? That's a good place to start. There's a bunch of questions within there, but we'll start with what is it and how does it work? (laughs) 
Yeah. So it, it really, the journey has been, been amazing, you know, going through building this, this platform and it started on my own journey. And, you know, I, I had been in the, in the software industry for a long time. And, you know, that involves, as, as we discussed previously, Nick, you know, a lot of travel and, and, and entertaining and, and certain lifestyle that, you know, it's probably not the most healthy for me anyway. You know, I lived in major, major cities in London and New York and San Francisco. And yeah, you know, it's, it's, you know, over time, it, it can be something that, that sort of turns you into the type of person that, that, you know, is probably engaging in activities and things that, you know, you probably shouldn't be and, and that aren't conducive of, of being a sort of, productive, successful, highly functioning, you know, contributor. And, you know, I found that over time, it, it just sort of started going, you know, in, in a bad direction for me. So I, uh, I sort of had my own recovery journey that started about seven years ago, around 2016. And, you know, had a couple of, of slip ups to say the least. And, you know, certainly to your point before, you know, I don't mind saying that, you know, I, I really kind of hit the bottom completely, you know, had to rebuild from, from scratch and, and from, from sort of nothing. And, and a friend of mine reached out to me and, you know, told me, Hey, I've got this program. It's neuroscience based and it's all around, you know, healthy habits. And we have a weekly group and meditation and, and, and all these great things. And I'd never heard of neuroscience. This is back in 2020. I started working on that program and I tried everything, you know, <laughs> every type of program possible and, you know, even some, some type of medication assisted treatment. And, you know, I found that parts helped, but couldn't really find anything that really worked. And, and this program just stuck with me. And, uh, yeah, it sounds ridiculous, but it worked in, in a really powerful way in a fairly short period of time. And, and it was as simple as just, Every morning, like sitting down and writing down, you know, what time did I get up? Have I done my daily intentions exercise, which is affirmations, gratitude, priorities for the day? How's my diet? And what are my priorities for household priorities for today? Am I sober? And then have I done my evening reflection, which is really very important in the early stages of, of recovery, of reflecting back on your day and and how, you know, what you can be proud of, things that maybe you haven't done so well that need improvement or an amends. And so I, I worked through that for oh, maybe six months. And during that time, just had this sort of transformational experience, really. And, you know, alongside that, I was going to, to you know, meetings and things. And I've been thinking about, you know, I'd seen this opportunity in the market for a, I was looking around and thinking, why is there not something like this, but that has incentives, that has rewards that actually motivate and engage people and keep them engaged long term. And I started working through this, this idea and, and thinking, well, you know, if, if, if that's the problem and the programs that are available, you know, generally, you know, while they have great components to them and in pieces, many of these programs have, you know, old stigmas attached to them and, and, you know, can be outdated. And as I looked around, I thought, you know, personally, I find it kind of disheartening, a little bit sad when, when you, you know, see someone who's, you know, maybe in their sixties and sitting there talking about, you know, how they used to drink like, 30 years ago and, and that they're, you know, an alcoholic. I mean, that you're not an alcoholic, you know, is my perspective on it. You know, you, you've, and certainly if you've been in recovery for 30 years, I just found that a, a really strange approach. So the way we've kind of combined things and, and the way that I approached this sort of problem was, well, if we can take the neuroscience healthy habit component, if we can attach rewards as incentives, which are proven to be the most effective treatment for individuals 
that are particularly uh, trying to change a behavior. And then we use our most recent addition is using pattern analysis with AI to be able to understand and baseline how how people are doing over a period of time, then that can be quite powerful. So, that, so that's really where it, where it started from. We got funding and from an angel investor who's who's actually repeated his investment. He's been in, invested in the company three times now, and has you know tremendous support. Has been through recovery himself and, and gone on to to do great things and. And yeah, so we, we've, you know, we've grown the, the, the platform. We've uh, got over 40,000 users total over the, the period since we began. Our attention is, is, is improving and has improved this year. We, we, we started making revenue this year and we're, we're helping people. We've got, you know, a ton of reviews and done feedback studies and are making new changes to to the product and based off of off of that. So yeah, it's it's been a it's been an amazing journey and and you know I've had to learn well every day learning new things. It's you know remarkable really and I keep reminding myself, you know, <laughs> there's there's the purpose is so important because it it gets me up in the morning and I get up like early. I mean I got up at four today. I had a a meeting at five, believe it or not, but well, you know how it is on the West Coast, Nick. <laughs> We're chasing the rest of the world, but it's uh, you know, it's it's so it, it's an incredible journey. This sort of evolving mindset, really, and the people that have you know given their time to to give advice, to help out, to you know, put in on, on the business as well has just been amazing. You know, opportunities like this to talk with you and, and your audience, you know, it all helps amplify and, and get the word out there. And, you know, it's, yeah, I, you know, I've really enjoyed it. It's incredibly rewarding. It's, it's tough at times, but it's, it's the best work I've, I've done for sure for, you know, well, ever. <laughs> yeah. Well, a lot of, a lot of follow ups from that inspiring story. And, and I, I didn't realize the scale. So you've already got 40,000 users. 40,000 signups. Yeah. Our active user base is, it fluctuates, but it's, I'd say, man, like more like four to 5,000, let's say on a monthly basis. And it really depends on, you know, the time of year and obviously certain months, you know, more popular, more busy. We run contests. We partner with Mobilize Recovery in, in, in September, which is recovery month. And, you know, so we see a big kind of spike there and we've got dry January around the corner and we're doing a few other things with some of our partners. So yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's been amazing actually to, to sort of see how, our user base has, has grown and yeah. And, and this year, you know, of course the key is <laughs> keeping the costs in control and down and our environment has been tough and we've seen many companies sort of come in and go out and some, some large companies, you know, struggle and, and smaller companies have had a hard time. You know, it's been, a, it's been a tough environment, but what it's done is, 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 you know, for us, it's meant that we had to get lean and, and, and really focus in on, you know, controlling our costs and our spend and, uh, and making sure that we kind of focus on the right things. So, yeah. So at the core over it is an app, right? Yeah. And how, how does it work? Like, it sounds like there's sort of three components. There's this AI pattern recognition, there's neuroscience, and then there's gamification. Or I, Gamification is not maybe the right word. It's more like this incentive, which I completely agree with you, like as a father of young kids, like if I try to get my kids to do anything, the number one most effective way is to, is to say, give them something that they want at the end of it. Because if I try to like scare them into it or something, like <laughs> no chance. So at the core, a human being is motivated by incentives. So I agree with that. So there's those three components. Let's say I'm someone who's struggling with an addiction or maybe just want to improve my life. Like what, what is, what does the app do for me? Like I sign in and then what happens? Yeah. So the first thing you do is we encourage people to connect their wearable device and by wearable, I mean, I mean, your phone is a, is a wearable, you know, well, not a wearable, it's a device and it has, you know, Apple health or Google fit, Fitbit and Aura ring and there are others coming. But the first thing we 
kind of suggest is you don't have to, but we recommend to connect your device. And the reason is that, you know, you'll obviously automate the process of bringing in your steps and your sleep data. So, and then you'll earn rewards for, for those on a daily basis. So that's the first thing. The second thing is turning on the notification reminders. We recommend that purely because it's a reminder. It's a nudge to set your daily intentions, which is the next thing. And, and the first thing really that after those things have been done that we recommend people do. And so that is a really a mindset priming exercise, Nick. So it's really kind of centering the mind into an exercise of, first of all, what are you grateful for today? Second thing, positive affirmations. And then setting forward your household priorities. And it sounds simple. And it, you know, in the beginning, when I, you know, looked at it, I thought really, you know, gratitude and affirmations, but that has been massively powerful for me. I, I think it, it's changed everything. I don't think I would have been able to get through some of the things that, that I've personally got through without having that exercise. And I've done it. I'm not going to say I've done it every single day for for the last three years, but almost. And so it's a, it's a really important first thing. It's the best way you can start your day to get your mindset in the right place. So that's kind of the first thing. The next thing is that we, you want to be exercising. So we pay out, you'll earn rewards for doing the daily intentions. Then you'll earn rewards for every thousand steps. Then you'll earn rewards for getting sleep between six to 10 hours, which are sleep doctors recommend. And then obviously, you know, eat well and other things. So yeah, it's, and there are videos in there as well that you can learn and earn to watch, which are more sort of informational videos. And then there's a marketplace as well where we have, you know, wellness brands that you can get discounts and sometimes free products to uh, to help you on on your journey. So, the um, what's the neuroscience behind? Because I, I I'm someone who's experimented with the sort of morning routine for for a long time, for over a decade, and and I can attest from personal experience that it absolutely works, and I highly <laughs> recommend it for everybody. But what what is the? There has to be neuroscience behind that, and and what is it? Yeah. So, so neuroscience, we, we talk about sort of the process of neuroplasticity. So it's really, when you look at, when you look at the brain or you study or research like brain science, and I'm not a neuroscientist, I should put that disclaimer out there. But when you, when you look at the, the brain and, and how it functions and, and how it, the reason why people choose substance in the first place, it's really a, a seeking of reward. And so the whole idea around neuroplasticity is that you can actually rewire and refire the neurons in your brain and your neural cortex that, that essentially allow you to be able to feel those senses of joy, excitement, fun, happiness, wh wh whatever that is. But the idea is that, that, you know, we're told many times that you have, you drink to excess, you take drug taking to excess and it puts holes in your brain and you're going to be sort of brain dead for the rest of your life. And to, it, when, when I heard about this, I found it actually very uplifting because that's what I'd been told, <laughs> you know, that you can't really mend things and you can't really be a highly kind of you know, functioning person, but, but it's not true. You know, neuroplasticity turns that around and says, actually you can. And, you know, if you take certain approaches and you focus on these things that help with your brain chemistry, yeah. you can effectively yeah. through the process of plasticity, uh, effectively, you know, have, have a brain that is functioning you know, as, as a healthy brain should. Let's take a quick break to hear from our sponsor. This episode of The Nick Hilera Show is brought to you by Metros Capital. If you're an investor looking for direct access to real estate investments, then we'd love to talk with you. Investment opportunities at Metros Capital balance financial returns and community impact. To learn more, contact us at metros.nickhilaris.com. Again, that's metros.nickhilaris.com. Now let's get back to the episode. 
when you were describing sort of the origin story for Oberit, I got the sense that like there was a component of the AA formula that didn't resonate with you. And it sounds like it's on this point, which is like the neuroscience suggests that there's a reason to be optimistic, even if you were severely addicted to something like alcohol and that the AA model, which is sort of premised on this idea of like, I'm no expert on AA, but I think I understand why they ask people to affirm that they're alcoholic, which is to face the truth instead of to hide from it. Yeah, true. But the truth can change. And I, I think that's what the neuroscience is, is like you can absolutely transform your life, even if you were a crazy addict. I, th I think, is that is that why you kind of turned away from AA uh, in your own experience? I wouldn't say I've turned, I haven't turned away from it. I, and actually what we've tried to do is is sort of incorporate the elements that that you know i personally think are, are really powerful in the program you know that are things and an approach i think it gives people a framework right nick that that's what it really does you know the 12 steps it's a very like it's a it's a process you know you you find a sponsor and they help you through the program i think there are elements of it that are fantastic and, and you can't deny that it works for many people what 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 i and this is you know again this is just i'm not against it in any way it's just i found it odd to have people still saying that they're an alcoholic all these years later and i don't believe in that term i just fundamentally think it's wrong right to label yourself for a number of years as you know an alcoholic i mean and uh, you're not born you're not born an alcoholic right you, you just I, I don't believe that either right there is maybe there is a genetic component component to it but you know i i absolutely believe that you know your environment is very powerful in terms of how you actually perceive the world the beliefs that you have and the values that you 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 you, you basically have as well. And, you know, I don't believe that, you know, I, I'm not an alcoholic, right? Do I have, you know, certain behavioral traits? Yes. <laughs> um, you know, and, and most people do. And I think that the important thing is that you're able to, you're able to get yourself to a place where you are mindful of being consistent with things that, are known and proven to help you progress and less likely to engage it with people, places, and products that can harm you or, or take you down to be the worst version of yourself. And, and that's sort of what we're trying to create is this, this environment and place and this approach and this mindset that over time, because it's proven that you know, the further you get down the road in, in your recovery, the less likelihood you have of, of, of going back to, you know, using a substance or being, you know, hooked on gaming or gambling or, or anything like that. And, and, and that's what we're focused on and trying to use financial, you know, behavioral economics, we call it, to help get people down that road and keep them engaged. And it's just my way of looking at it, Nick. And, you know, everyone's, I suppose, got their own kind of view on things. And, and I mean, what's your, what's your perspective on that? I'm not sure I have enough personal experience to have one, you know, having not, having not engaged at all in, in either AA or anything like that. You know, I have some close friends of mine who've been through AA and it, it's changed their lives in a, in a super positive direction. And I met you and I know that this neuroplasticity stuff is working. And so it's probably a little bit of a, like a lot of things in life. If we need all of it, right. It's like different approaches work for different people. And so we should just do it all. Yeah. That's what I think. Yeah. It's, you know, I think that there are so many good and different resources and, you know, they're, they're whatever works, <laughs> you know, I've never, I've never really said, you know, Hey, this is the be all, you know, this is going to work for everyone. It's not, it may work for some people and some people get it and some people don't. And, you know, I acknowledge that it, it's also it's important to kind of realize that, 
there are different stages that people, you know, go through, whether they're, you know, whether it's sort of a more behavioral health type of thing or whether it's a more kind of substance led thing. But generally, we want to be able to support people wherever they are in their journey. But we certainly, you know, know where we fit and where we don't and where we kind of add the most value. And so we want to kind of focus on on that and and let the others <laughs> that are doing their thing in, in their particular areas do their thing. And, you know, I would love to think that we can all kind of play well or nicely together, uh, you know, as much as possible. Yeah. And, and it sounds like with, with over it, it's, it's about creating a tool. It's not the only tool. It's a tool to help somebody at different points in their journey. Could, could somebody, who's like severely addicted to a substance, could they, could they use this system to make progress or do they need an initial intervention first? And then they need to get on this, this path of these various practices that the app sort of prompts you to do. I mean, it, again, it, it depends on where they are, Nick. What I've seen is, is so two examples. If, if we have, we would not be a good fit for, the person who's really struggling, heavily intoxicated and needs to go into a inpatient type of, of program. You know, we, we, there's this thing called continuing care, which is kind of, as you come through that process and, and transition into, you know, actual life outside, you know, living outside of, of, of a, of a rehab, for example. Um, you know, that's where we can start to have a difference because that's where people struggle actually a lot is, you know, all of a sudden you're thrown into the wilderness, <laughs> back into the real world. And all of a sudden you've got, as I mentioned before, the people, places and products all around you. And same is true of, of people who come, you know, out of, uh, correctional facilities or, or prisons, you know, it's tough. Re-entering is, is very difficult for many people. And, and I completely empathize with that. And, and that's sort of where we can have the biggest impact. But we also see a lot of our user bases, you know, our sweet spots like 25 to 45, let's say. And, you know, we have obviously younger users and, and older users as well. And, but we see a lot of individuals that are already in recovery, that have been in recovery for a while. And they like the platform because it, it allows them to, you know, continue with their journey, earn rewards as they're doing things, but it acts as a reminder for them. And, you know, sometimes that's really powerful, you know, because the worst thing you can do is get complacent <laughs> in recovery. And, and, you know, I try to remind myself all the time and, and take these moments where uh, you have to sort of really think about, okay, well, yeah, you know, uh, remember that thing. You don't want to go back there. And, 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 you know, these types of reminders, and that's why the gratitude actually works is a really good exercise because it, brings you back to simple things, you know, each day that, that can help. So yeah, is that, does that help sort of yeah, with definitely. Where, we, where we fit and yeah. 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 And it, your point about re-entry is fascinating. Uh, and, and, and I think it applies beyond re-entry because like just the normal challenge of life, we live in a world that is unbelievably sophisticated and wealthy and blah, blah, blah. But what's come along with that is it is like, choose your own adventure at any moment. You can get basically whatever your heart's desire is. I mean, you obviously mm -hmm. need to have financial resources, but like I could walk out of my house and get any drug I wanted. I could do anything on the internet. Like it's a crazy, crazy amount of problems kind of in the background. But if you don't engage with them, then they don't mess your life up, but they could. It's there. It's just out there for, and, and waiting to take people in for whatever reason. It's kind of crazy. Yeah. <laughs> and that sort of, that makes me think about, for me, when I look at, people used to say to me all the, all the time, like, how do you, how do you, especially my, my partner, she would say, well, you know, how do you not hate alcohol, you know, and look at it and just not want to go near it? And And I thought, you know, at the time I thought, well, yeah, you're right. You know, probably I should think that, <laughs> but now I do like now, 
you know, I just, well, I, actually now I don't even think about it. I just, you know, it just doesn't bother me really. So, but my point is, I think that people need to get to that point, Nick, where those thoughts aren't even registering. It's not like now, you know, for example, there's a bottle of wine in, in the in the fridge from Thanksgiving and it doesn't bother me. But generally we take alcohol, you know, we don't have alcohol in the house really for the most part, only if, you know, at holiday time there might be, but... But yeah, it, it's it's just, again, it comes back to, it's an unfortunate thing, but oftentimes you have to go through, and you mentioned this earlier, you have to go through failure or complete loss or just being knocked, you know, knocked, knocked down to, to really seriously, or to have a, an experience of some kind. You know, people talk about epiphanies and things, and, and I, you know, believe in that fully. We talked about this the last time. It happens and to some people, and it is amazingly powerful, but it takes that, and that's kind of unfortunate that sometimes it does. But, you know, the way I look at it is that, I always used to look at failure and, and you know, my, my dad, for example, you know, he's one of those like, you know, he's old school. And so to him, like failure is, is, is not good. It's bad, you know, and generally I think most people have had that approach, but going through this exercise and, and going through the startup, you know, system and going through the fundraising and the sort of the, the constant, like, no, no, no. To, to eventually get to a yes, but, but that takes incredible level of, of sort of strength and, and courage and, and resilience. And, you know, you, you, you can't get that without uh, having a few, you know, knockdowns and, and, and experiencing, you know, hitting the bottom and having to pick yourself up. And, and, you know, I think what, what we want to, what want to do and what I'm trying to instill in, into our platform is that, you know, I think with everything that's going on in the world, you know, it, it's it's more important now than than it's ever been really for us, everyone to be able to be doing things that help to build that level of strength and resilience and and that acceptance that you're not going to win <laughs> all the time, and you know that's just the reality. And 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 I think that is actually you know one of the things that in AA and again that we talked about earlier that it's accepting that you know look this thing it's unmanageable now it's got the better of me it's I I need to address it and fix it and and be better than it and and overcome it and and that's really what it's about you know and yeah it's it's just it's a it's an interesting thing but uh yeah what a journey what a journey. Well, what I, what I love about your story though, Will, is that, you know, you, you, you had this, this experience in your life where you, you basically hit rock bottom and, and had that moment. And in response to that, you sought help, you tried these different things and you found something that worked for you. And then you, you didn't stop there. You said, you know what, like this actually worked for me. So how can I make this available to, to people all over the world? And, and, and I think that's what's beautiful about the intention behind your company and, and, um, why I wish you, you know, success. I hope this thing grows and I hope you can help as many people as possible. I think just my understanding of the app, like, look, it can help people who are on this recovery journey, but it also can help someone who's just trying to transform their life in a different way, right? Like the, the principles that, are behind this are also the principles that are behind things like extreme weight loss and other personal transformations. It's kind of the same, the same stuff, which is super cool. So I hope you guys can continue, but what, what is your vision? Like we're sitting here today in late, late 2023. What's, what's your vision for, for the company going forward? Let's reframe your question. If you said to me, what would make you feel like you've kind of achieved what you want to achieve with what your pursuit is with this business, it would be to prove that we can help prevent relapses and have a measurable, meaningful impact on that problem. Because if we can, 
then the overall problem here in the US is going to go down. Simple as that. And so if I can stand there and say that we were able to have a, a, a significant impact and help stop people relapsing, that's huge. And that's really our goal. And I would love to be able to get to that point and, and, you know, and to build it with, with a team around me who's, you know, wants to be part of this as well is, is, is important too. So yeah, that's a beautiful vision. And you all are in the process of raising what a series, uh, are you still in the sort of angels or are you doing the series A at this point? Yeah, no, we're, we're, we're not in the series A. We're seed coming into seed. We're basically just in this kind of nonstop raise at the moment. We're currently on, on WeFund and we are, you know, talking with angels and we're talking with healthcare focused funds, which, you know, is exciting. And, and, you know, obviously we're looking for other investment partners all the time. We've got, you know, quite a large raise target to hit, you know, and we, we've raised a, a good amount so far, about 600,000 total. And we, we've got a lot of work to do on top of that. But yeah, it's, that's where we are. We're, we're, we, kind of expect that that will run through Q1 for sure. We've got a new product release coming up in Q1 as well, which I'm excited about and introducing some new, you know, features that I've, I've been, you know, wanting to introduce for a long time, including a coach. And, you know, we want to get to a point where we're, we're, we're really a guide for people, Nick, and to help them with, you know, all different areas of, of their life. But we also, to your point earlier, want to be able to help people who progress, keep progressing through their journey and, and not, you know, stay at this level where, you know, they have to feel as though they're a recovering alcoholic, for example. And, and now, it, you know, they can say, I've got a growth mindset or I'm a, you know, peak performance person and whatever it might be. But, you know, there's, we want to focus on that coming into next year as well. So, yeah, exciting times ahead. And yeah, I want to thank, you know, everyone who's supported us so far. And, you know, from a funding perspective, you know, from a, a subscriber perspective and our advisors and, and, you know, everyone out there who's really contributed to, to the, to the company. And, you know, my, my career was, you know, really based off of mentors early in, in my career. I was, you know, I, I had some very good mentors who knew a lot more than, than I did, obviously. And, you know, they gave their, their time and, and, you know, to kind of help me out and probably super annoying, you know, to them. But, you know, I think it's, it's, it's so important to, to do that. And I, you know, obviously give back to, to, you know, people who are coming into the company and people outside the company as well and, and try to give back in, in as, as many ways as possible. And uh, yeah, you know, I, I really hope that, you know, it's, this is inspires people and, and we want to be a platform that, that does that and a company that does that. I mean, we've, you know, both of our largest investors are, are in recovery and have gone on to, you know, do very well. And, and many of our advisors and doctors, you know, on our team have uh, dealt with recovery themselves as well. And it's just, it, it's really inspirational. And in our program, you know, same thing. And the more that we can help inspire others with, with our stories and, and how we've, you know, overcome these hurdles and obstacles, which inevitably will come. <laughs> for all of us it's just life but yeah i you know first and foremost want to be want to make sure that people you know anything's possible even you know when you're at the bottom it's it's possible to rebuild uh from from nothing you know for anybody and I really believe that anybody should have a chance to, to, to do that. And, you know, I think that our approach is, is one approach that, it, that can be helpful. So anyway. <laughs> no, this, this is a great way to end it. You know, any, anything is possible. I love what you're doing and, and wish you the best. Thank you for coming on the show and for sharing your story and, and being so open and, and, 
introducing us to, well, you know, your mission. Thanks for being here, Will. Yeah. Thank you, Nick. Appreciate it. Thank you for listening to The Nick Hilaris Show. We hope you enjoyed the episode and would appreciate your help with spreading the word by sharing with your network on social. And until next time, remember, it's not about pursuing success to unlock fulfillment. It's about learning how to find fulfillment in the midst of success.